Hello and welcome to Discovery, conversations about the power of the arts to connect us to each other and to place. I'm Victoria Rogers, Vice President of Arts at the Knight Foundation. Joining me today is Suzanne Charles, designer, curator, researcher, co-founder, and director of the design studio Roof of Two, and Olga Stella, Vice President of Strategy and Communication at the College for Creative Studies, and Executive Director of Design Corps Detroit, a part of the college that works to position Detroit as a global source of creative talent. We want you to be an active participant today in the conversation. So if you have questions, please submit them through the show via Twitter using the hashtag Night Live and in the comments section of the Facebook live stream. We'll get to as many of them as we can throughout the conversation. Cezanne and Olga are two design advocates who've been working on a number of projects separate and collaboratively that convey why inclusive design matters and what it looks like in practice. Cezanne and Olga, welcome to Discovery. Thanks for having us. So ladies, let's start, Olga. Could you begin with what it means to be, um, the fact that Detroit is the only city in the US recognized as a UNESCO city of design? Absolutely, it is both an honor and a, um, uh, an opportunity for us. Five years ago, Detroit was uh, competitively selected and Cezanne was part of the um, application process for the UNESCO designation along with our prior executive director and our team. And what it really was, it, it was a recognition from our UNESCO colleagues that the way that design happens in Detroit and what it means is special and unique and something that the rest of the world could learn more about. And we'll, talk, we'll be talking a little bit more about that today, you know, around what it means to um, try to practice design in an inclusive way. But that's what our colleagues from around the world wanted to, to learn about and to see the way that the grassroots in Detroit really helped drive the design discussion, not so much the grass tops. Gotcha. So all got, I mean, Cezanne, title of our talk is design as a verb. You know, so many people, they think about design, you might think of one of those gorgeous old buildings or a new building. Uh, for me, it could be a really great pair of shoes that I really hope are gonna be comfortable. Is there a little form and function in that shoe besides just being stunning? So what are some of the misconceptions that people have about design? And what does design mean as a process? Yeah. So I would say that, you know, whether we're talking about those traditional aspects of fashion or garment or building um, or even product design and development, they all sort of begin with this kind of listening process. And the way that designers might go about that looks differently um, depending on the kind of industry or sector they're in. They could be listening to the kind of consumer base by paying attention to um, sort of what they know in terms of market data, in terms of demand, in terms of, you know, past history. But they're is this kind of foundational start to a project, which is around how are we listening to, to the people that we're trying to serve through our products or our services or our buildings and environments or our technology. But I think where inclusive design and sort of design really thinking about itself more as a verb rather than a noun goes is how do we sort of continue that listening all the way throughout? And then how do you actually encourage and empower users to sort of be the architects of that own sense making through the process? So I think it's more about then how do you carry that listening throughout and how does listening turn into engagement and accountability? And I think that's the, the kind of shift that we're seeing as we talk more about inclusive design and certainly design as a set of processes that are really supposed to be um, in, a, in a virtuous kind of feedback loop with the very people that you're designing with and for. And I think uh, that the biggest pivot is that designing with as opposed to just designing for. And it, that sort of goes beside um, beyond that term I'm so used to is the design charrette, where it's sometimes it's it's a one time you know it's here's the design you get feedback sort of, but it's not necessarily an ongoing conversation about the process. Yeah, yeah, 
That's so true. I think that um, you know one of the things that's really hard is is you have to think about and kind of explore your own design process to really think about you know where can you sort of um, be looking at opportunities for ongoing engagement and those have real like timeline and budgetary constraints and so not every design process will always be fit for kind of running a fully inclusive process but unless we sort of check our assumptions that we have to run processes that don't have kind of the right kind of timing or budgeting or scheduling that sort of um, earmarks inclusion as a principle, you know, so how are we resourcing inclusion as a principle in our projects, then you do get kind of um, the, the sort of, you know, here's my design, here's this active persuasion um, that I'm doing as a designer, where we're in conversation, but I've already baked in a lot of assumptions already yeah. into, the, into the project or work. So Olga, why do designers need other people to be involved in the design process? They're trained, you know, we're getting to that now. They're trained professionals with a specialized knowledge and this experience. Why aren't they in the best position to design places and products and services for the rest of us? Well, I mean, we certainly at the College for Creative Studies, you know, believe in the value of a design education and just the, the specialized skills that artists and designers have to be these kinds of creative problem solvers. But I think we all recognize that as humans, we have limited points of view. And that when, you know, to Cezanne's point, um, you know, as we were talking about what it means to design as a verb, um, this idea of designing with people, of being engaged in relationships with people, that's a, a practice that um, also requires learning. And, it, and it's not necessarily um, the way that designers have worked. Of course, there are, um, you know, leaders in the field who, who have been doing this, as I mentioned before, you know, we have, you know, over 60 partners in the city of Detroit alone who have been practicing in different ways, uh, many inclusive design practices, but our educational institutions have not um, necessarily this kind of practice of designing with people. Um, you know, it still needs a lot of work. It still needs to be institutionalized. There's, um, I think, still very much a, um, you know, kind of, um, you know, my point of view, my kind of bespoke creation um, view that a lot of um, designers have. And sometimes that's, that is pushed by budget. It's pushed by the um, constraints that um, a designer is presented with, whether it's time or the client's expectation or, you know, for many reasons. But I think what, what you know, we have found a more real, um, proponents of the work that Kat Holmes has done in her book, Mismatch, is yeah. this idea that when we work with others, when we start to break down this process and really engage the people who are typically most excluded from places, from products, from services, we're going to get better products with better customer engagement, you know, bigger audiences. We're going to reduce our, the, the issues around fixing things that go wrong later. And we're going to be more innovative, and so this is this is a skill that um, that does have to be taught. And um, some institutions like CCS are, are really looking at how how to teach that, but it's not necessarily widespread through the field. Yeah, I think one of the personal experience here in Miami um, when I was working with the, the New World Symphony, and we had Frank Gehry designing the building, and we had West Eight as the landscaper for around it, but we were the developer for city property. And mm -hmm. how, how that's different when you're working that in a city space and public pr private property, but that they all impact us. But Andrea Gusa at West 8 was a master at really listening and incorporating people's thoughts. And I think they ended up with a, a really good workable public space that was outside the front lawn of the building. But Let's go. Let's think about uh, some of the projects that the two of you are working on in Detroit. So, you know, Olga, you recently released a design guide for real estate development. Why yeah, this guide and why did you create it? Yeah, we, uh, this is the second in a series 
of design guides that um, Design Core has produced. The first one, uh, design the design guide for neighborhood business. And what we wanted to do with um, with these is really, it's not a guide that teaches design. It talks to this guide in particular is talking to real estate developers, especially emerging ones, you know, um, folks who are start trying to work in community about the design process and how to engage with designers. And I think one of the things that is special about this guide is is um, what we try to do is pull pull throughout in each part of each uh, phase of the real estate development process to really try to make the case not just for why a designer is going to bring value to the project, but why more community engaged practices will bring value to a private real estate project and um, and try to give some practical tips for developers who are trying to work in Detroit neighborhoods because I think we're all. Um, you know, as, as advocates for inclusion equity are really committed to, you know, how can design help drive more equitable outcomes as we see, you know, real estate development happening in Detroit. And another one, I was reading in one, I think it was from a speech that you had, getting, had given, but not so interested in the development of public space. Mm -hmm. And I know that one of those, the Wilson Jr. Centennial Park design and the Detroit Riverfront Conservancy. I mean, having enjoyed that, I, I just wonder if you could just talk a little bit about that, the process that was used or how, what's really important about designing a public space that works? Well, you want everyone to be able to participate in it. And it's hard to, um, uh, develop a public space that does, you know, that, that truly welcomes everyone if you don't involve people in the process. And what I love about what the Detroit Riverfront Conservancy um, did with the Wilson Centennial Park um, is they really, they didn't just assume that the people that they were engaging had um, the full range, that they had access to all the experiences and um, information that would ultimately color their opinions. And so they, they really invested in showing people examples of, of great public spaces and, and engaging in a, in a real dialogue around what the elements of a, of a great public space that would work in Detroit would be, not by assuming that they had already had experienced those, those spaces in their own neighborhoods. And I think that's, that's a really important part of both um, tapping into the lived experience of, of residents and, and your customers and people you're trying to engage with, you know, in your audience, but also recognizing that um, there is an opportunity to broaden what those experiences are too, and to have a, a deeper engagement around the content that way. The, the other one that really interested me in, in this same article was a, under the title of reforming the criminal justice system. But it, it was the um, Justice City Innovation Lab and the Detroit Justice Center convening national partners across fields, law, design, technology, architecture, and public health, which I think also reinforces your point that it's not just about the design of a building. That's, that's not, you know, design isn't limited to the designs of buildings or those type of products. But when they looked at design alternatives, for actually creating a youth detention center. Mm -hmm. And I just, if, if you, either one of you could say something about that, about, you know, what, what came out of that or what will come out of that, that you think is really different that would not have happened had there not been this flo focus on um, uh, the approach of using inclusivity in the design. Yeah, I think, you know, so Amanda Alexander and the Justice Center's work has just been so, um, um, and really, I think reshaping what our possible visions of the future are and in involving young people and community members and thinking about, you know, what is what does the world look like if we have a completely different view of what justice looks like? And, yeah. um, you know, I think I mean, Cezanne probably has a lot more to add on this, but I think just especially in the last year um, with the pandemic and everything, the, the, the Amanda's voice and the voices of others who've been involved in that project, I think, have been really helpful in helping us challenge some of our assumptions about just the systems that we're all living and working in. And I think that is an important opportunity for designers um, to be engaged, um, really by by asking different questions. By right? she's they they ask they they set the set of problems. The, the question that they're trying to solve for is not the question of 
how do we build a criminal justice center? It is really like, what is justice and what does justice look like? Yeah. Olga, okay, you got a, I mean, Suzanne, do you have a comment you'd like to make in response to that one? Yeah. So the thing that I find, um, as Olga mentioned, really interesting about that project is the way that it sort of asks us to sort of reimagine a kind of reality, a kind of lived reality that we've inherited that often we feel disempowered to do anything about. And so really that work feels very centered in the way that design can be a powerful force for both collective reimagining and sort of shaping more just and equitable futures. And then the idea that buildings and products and services and policies flow from that, right? Like fro flow from that point. And also the way that they have thought internally about then what that means as an organization, bringing in kind of artists and designers as residents into the heart of like their work and sort of the case they continually make um, as advocates for the, for the idea that the construction of our environments does play a really vital large role in our construction of sort of civil discourse and civil society. And so I think that that's um, really a powerful framing for what design can do in service of kind of other um, realms, other expertise, other other interests. And I think we'll, just we'll get in. Yeah, go ahead. No, sorry, just up and build off of that, you know, then then you can look at specific products or digital interfaces or you know, I think I think the way that that project has kind of questioned this reality and the set of assumptions that allows a lot of more detailed kind of work to happen for the specific things. And I think sometimes, um, you know, you ask Cezanne, like, you know, what is design and how are we thinking about it? We often focus on those very specific things, like the building or the park or the, yeah. you know, the um, uniform, you know, whatever it is. Um, but when you design as a verb, you're taking a step back from that. And I think you're really questioning what that whole context is. Um, and that's where the engagement with the people who are often excluded, the people who don't get their voices heard, the people who don't get to be at the table or in the room. It's at that point where I think it's most important because then the kind of design expertise of that trained professional in developing the product has flows from those those experiences and viewpoints in developing better a better website or product or you know um you know place for for people we're gonna we're gonna talk a little bit later about a project the two of you are, are working on but you know so much of this is you have people that come out as architects and engineers and all of these other things that aren't necessarily trained in that or not necessarily as aware that you might want them to be. So what has to change even with the training of people that are in design for, for what you're talking about to be really successful? Well, I think Cezanne should, should take this one because at the college, we've um, hired Cezanne and John Marshall, her partner at Root of Two to help develop a new approach for us, both as we think about our interface with the community, but also as we think about our faculties and students and staff and the kind of impact that we want the college to make in the future, um, both through Design Corps, but, but as an educational institution. So I'll turn it over to Design, to Cezanne. Thanks, Olga. So yeah, we've been really excited to kind of dig in and think about how you sort of um, build the idea of a, of a basis of like training or curriculum or professional development um, that in and of itself kind of practices what it preaches in terms of learning how to design with and through um, you know communities and residents that may not be coming with design expertise to the table but come with a whole host and range of kind of lived expertise um, that have you know that is vital for sort of getting the sort of problem framing problem definition or issue definition um, and frame right at the start of a project and so you know for us that work has really been about how do you sort of um, understand some of this 
kind of tried and true ranges. Like as designers, we may not sort of think of ourselves as being like the most empowered or powerful person in a room, but quite frankly, when we sort of um, sort of find ourselves in community, we sort of fail to sort of understand our sort of expertise, our sort of privilege, our own sort of power, and we don't appropriately negotiate or seed that in ways that we should. And so, you know, what are the set of uh, practices that have to sort of um, be strengthened in our discipline uh, in order to sort of meet people where they're at and really understand what's vital about the kind of ways that we should be thinking about co-designing um, with others for sort of more just and equitable, whether it's products or services or, or communities, we have to really think about that. And so we've um, gone through almost a year long process now where we've been interviewing, we've been working with people, we've been running kind of workshops, we've been benchmarking and looking at kind of best and next practices um, from folks who are already kind of doing this both kind of in community situated contexts as well as in sort of educational context, higher educational context, and really trying to, you know, learn from the field what are those practices that have found some success and then trying to think about how they can sort of help us operationalize um, the very things that we're starting to see from the UNESCO City of Design Partners in Detroit mm -hmm. and many others that are not partners in Detroit who have, you know, um, always been working in this way. And so how do we sort of turn um, sort of that listening and learning back on ourselves to think about like, you know, what are the things that in our discipline are quite frankly problematic? Uh, where do we have to stand up and hold up our hands and say that the discipline has run alongside of capital in ways that have been both pernicious and harming in communities of color across the country and in cities across the country and for sustainability and climate change across the country, right? So there's a lot of sort of responsibility and accountability that we end up having to think about in terms of the way that the discipline in sort of assuming its very neutrality um, has sort of perpetuated these harms. And so if you know that that's the context that communities meet you with, you have to sort of be, you know, first able to acknowledge that, I think. So, we so we've, got a, we've got a question um, that relates to that. So this is from Peter. I don't know which city, but I know here in Miami, we think about this a lot. How can design promote a healthier and more welcoming environment? So your last comment sort of touched on that, but what would you say in response to that? So my first response is trust is everything. Um, you kind of can't move forward with any sort of design process unless you've established a basis of trust. And sometimes that means really acknowledging deeply harm. You have to sort of think about what may be trauma-informed practices that need to sort of um, be embraced as kind of the start of that. And, it, and I think that builds a lot of the kind of um, capital you need with the with the communities you want to work in service with. Um, and then from there, I think you can sort of start to articulate a vision, you know, much like we touched on with kind of Amanda's work at DJC, like you can start to really embrace a vision of what is health, right? What is safety? What is justice? How does that sort of give us the built environment that we deserve and need? How does that give us the kind of access to technology that we might need? Um, how does that give us the kind of products and services and systems that we need? But I think unless you kind of start with that um, real level setting of where you've been as a discipline, what your own positionality is as a designer, and then sort of um, look to sort of build trust off of, off of that, um, you can't really define what is a, a fully healthy system or city um, yeah. without those things. Olga, you have anything to add before we move on to a... Yeah, I mean, I would just say, I think flowing from that um, kind of the problem framing that Cezanne outlines, like what do you mean by a healthy, welcoming environment? Yeah. It's been every single detail. I mean, ultimately what designers are doing is they're arranging parts and pieces to create you know, these systems, places, products, so on, right? And and they are there they have the creativity and the the skills to be able to figure out how to make these parts and pieces go together. But sometimes, you know, even like a, a font, a typeface can signal um, something different to maybe a different cultural community than to another one. And it is really about 
um, I think being extremely intentional about every single decision. Every single decision matters. And if you do it within the frame, if you properly set your problem, you have a, have a really inclusive view of what this context is with all these voices at the table, you can make um, all of those decisions in a much better way. So a problem that, you know, um, not a problem, but a project that is, is close to my heart anyway, is this, the opportunity to create sort of a, for, for, a formal cultural district in Detroit and the work that both of you have been doing on that, but especially um, Roof of Two. But, you know, as we look at that cultural district in Midtown Detroit, you know, it's, it's gonna unify 13 cultural institutions across 86 acres. But one of the first, first phases of this was the digital inclusion. So Cezanne, I wonder if you could talk about why the digital transformation matters in that particular district, how you're bringing community members into that conversation. So it ends up being, the results end up being inclusive and what those 13 participating arts and cultural organizations will learn and sort of these different tools that they'll have available to them for how they can engage and attract people. Because at the end of this, it's all about informed, engaged communities and being incredibly inclusive in the solutions that we come up with to address the issues of today. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, the project um, is is one that you know involves many stakeholders, many partners, many designers, um, and institutions that are looking at both physical and landscape transformations in the city. And I think one of the things I always come back to is this idea, or especially the way that Root of Two thinks about this, is the way that technology itself is actually physical. It is material, right? So when we think about kind of place-based space transformation. How are we thinking about the way that the built environment is a perfect opportunity to think about how are we including more people? And so one of the things that very early on we sort of understood about the project, and I think even um, more so after sort of the various lockdowns that the cultural institutions yeah. were having um, to sort of pivot and deal with, but I think even before that, what we were hearing from from them is the way that they were looking at how they wanted to engage with audiences, um, both before the visit kind of and after the visit. And I think we sort of initially were thinking about that visitor journey, right, to the cultural center. How do you begin to help people before they've even actually encountered place to sort of feel a part of a district and center and the way that technology can empower that. And then as we began to really dive into the, you know, where we're, we have um, the benefit of having a citywide initiative called Connect 313 that has been looking at digital inclusion more broadly in the city. And so as we dug into the sort of data of what does inclusion look like across the city when, you know, 40% of uh, homes are connected to the internet or have a device, right? Um, what does it mean to then understand that Midtown, when we tend to think about Midtown as being gentrified and completely done and amenity rich and full of both cultural and educational institutions, what does it tell us when we find out that the data says that only 51% of people in that district are connected and have a device and have a data plan? And what do you mean by culture when you think about your public institutions, whether it's the DIA or the public library or the history museum who, you know, or the Charles H. Wright who are on the front line of telling us the vital stories we need to learn about ourselves at this moment in time and the way that they now have to reach us through the internet um, and the way that they have to think about programming in their own business models and digital transformation as being delivered um, through the internet, right? And so I think for us, it became critically important to think, what could we do in the next year over 2021 that would give us a vital way of connecting people? So the first was to work with Wayne State to extend their wireless and Wi-Fi system so that we can offer free um, publicly accessible outdoor Wi-Fi um, as a partnership with Route of Two, Wayne State University and Midtown Detroit Inc. And then finally, how do we then set up a series of capacity building workshops as well as tests 
um, and pilots of cultural interventions that the institutions themselves can design and run and get real-time feedback with um, kind of members of the public through. And so we're excited about how that work is going to take place um, with community able to sort of engage in feedback in something that feels very real and very manifest that then can sort of look at what are the long-term possibilities of technology within the district. I think it's, ex it, it, it's exciting for me having walked it and having been in almost every one of those institutions, but how this access to digital can be used, you know, within that and what can be learned and how you protect data, all of the things that are going to come, you know, out of eventually out of this project. And it's, yeah. it can be a great, great test model for how to do something in the right way. So right. Olga, any, any, we're ladies, we're almost out of time as I knew we would be in a second. Um, anything else you would like to add? No, I mean, I'm just excited about just the opportunities that we have before us. I mean, and especially um, it's, it's a really, I think, hard, you know, it's a hard time in our country and in our city for, for many, many people. And what makes me excited is that, you know, there's so many committed um, advocates for both designers and people working in, in a lot of um, really important ways, whether it's around, you know, voting rights or placemaking or um, entrepreneurship and who are this, this question around how do we do better? How do we include more people? You know, that, that there is that, that the drumbeat, you know, it's a conversation has been going on for years. So it's definitely not new, but I, I feel less and less like it's a conversation that's going on only in certain corners. And while there's always a danger, you know, when things become kind of mainstream, that they'll become, um, you know, uh, you know, vanilla. Um, I think I, what I'm excited about, the, the, I know we're working on, we're working on with Cezanne and others, is that um, there's, a, uh, I think, a, a greater commitment to solving some of these systematic challenges that we face and, um, and really following the solutions through. And um, I just hope that people will engage with us and, and you know, we're all on this learning journey together. So really looking forward to learning from others and from other experiences as we try to you know, implement the training program, do you know, the next phase of our design competition, yep. you know, the month of design, all of this that's happening. Um, we, we want more engagement with more people who are really committed, I think, to this, um, to this work. It is always fun to have conversations with the two of you. I like being your partners in some of these endeavors, but we are out of town. So for all of the, the folks online watching us, um, thank you for doing so. Special thanks to Olga and Cezanne and to our production crew for making this happen for us. The beats you heard at the top of the show were actually created by Chris Barr, uh, our director of art and technology here at night. And the music that is gonna play us out is composed and performed by the amazing jazz pianist, Theron Brown. But next up on January 21st on Night Live is a session, an episode of Coast to Coast. And the title for that one is Building Prosperous Communities Through In Inclusive Accessible Entrepreneurship. So we hope to see you there again January 21st, 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Have a great afternoon and thanks for joining us today.